Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Steckler, and I'm one of the three co-chairs of the Senior Law Day Collaborative. And I welcome everyone this morning to attend a fabulous program on the Consumer Directed Personal Care Program. And that program um, is being presented by our two guests this morning, Dana Pavlock and Laura Megwell from Preferred Home Care of New York's Mid-Hudson region. And they're able to answer questions or help you with all of your consumer directed needs. And we're gonna do the question and answer just a little differently today. So as questions come to mind, please enter them into the Q&A and the chat. And after Dana's part of the presentation, we'll go and we'll answer those questions in the order in which they came in. And then for the second half with Laura, we'll do the same thing. So we'll answer the questions as they're, as they're coming in. So without further ado, please welcome our terrific speakers, Dana and Laura for this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and we are, uh, you know, you and Bruce, we wanna extend a special thanks for allowing us the opportunity to provide uh, this workshop today. Uh, we're excited about it. It is our, uh, at least my first time doing a Zoom presentation. So I'll ask people to bear with me as I go through this, because usually we do entertain questions and answers as we go along. But um, what we're going to do, and you know, myself and uh, Laura are uh, going to present, we're gonna split it up. I'm gonna start off by talking about some of the history, the terms, uh, the, the eligibility requirements, myths and facts, and, uh, and then turn it over to Laura. And all the stuff that I cover, all the detail, she's gonna put, uh, make it real by talking to you about real life examples in terms of what it's like to go from start to finish uh, to uh, get involved and in, uh, set up with the receiving CDPAP services. So that's what we're going to do. And um, I want to share the slides now. So we're going to get going because we have a lot to cover. Okay, perfect. And here we go. So in terms of the definitions, um, the consumer, before we get into there, the direct care uh, history for consumer directed care uh, it started back in 1995 as a demonstration project called the Patient Managed Home Care Program. And within uh, that year, it was elevated to program status uh, and renamed CD, uh, uh, PAP, uh, Consumer Directed Personal Assistant Program, which we'll call CDPAP from here more, moving forward. The, uh, we, it's interesting to note that when it first started back in 1995, there were only three uh, companies, uh, which are called fiscal intermediaries, and we'll I'll talk about that a little bit. Those uh, companies, uh, there was only 15 of them. They served about uh, 1,500 uh, consumers only for those first three years. By the time 2020 came, there were over 390 FIs and servicing over 100,000 individuals uh, through the consumer directed uh, program. And then just in February, the Department of Health, just so you know, uh, you know, did a cutback and they scaled down the number of FIs from 390 to 68. Uh, we fortunately were one of those 68 companies uh, that were selected to continue with CDPAP. And uh, like others, we service probably about 40 counties uh, or so throughout the state. So that's just a little history. Um, the, it was established, uh, you know, the law that was uh, set to establish CDPAP was to provide services for the chronically ill or physically disabled that were receiving care under the Medicaid benefit uh, that allowed flexibility, freedom of choice, and uh, you know, to obtain, obtain home care services. The, the reality too is that what happened way back then is that if you received, if you were eligible for Medicaid and you needed home care prior to this, the only option to go was to uh, access personal care aids and home health aids through a licensed home care agency who were in contract with DSS. And uh, the reality is, is that while there's a lot of licensed home care agencies out there, they could not serve the entire area in rural areas, extremely difficult for people to get care uh, from licensed agencies because they couldn't deploy staff out there. So a lot of those people that needed the care uh, that were eligible and entitled uh, had to rely on family members, friends, neighbors, and the general community for uh, help. So. This basically formalized that. It allowed that to continue to happen, but rather than just providing the help out of the kindness of their heart, at this point, the uh, consumers were able to select and choose a provider who they knew and trusted, and they can now get paid through Medicaid. So you hear on those commercials, uh, you, know, you're, you, know, you can hire someone you know and trust or a family member, 
and you know get paid by Medicaid. I'm sure you've seen the te television commercials recently and some radio uh, advertisements, but that is true. So it was partly due to, to allow the flexibility and freedom of choice, uh, but also due, I think, out of necessity to get some of the care to the people that really needed it and weren't getting it through the licensed home care agencies. Go to the next slide. The law is also established, if you're interested in looking up the law, uh, what the roles and responsibilities are for the uh, FIs and the consumers that participate in the program. We're going to get into some of that. Okay, so some of the definitions. Self-directing consumer, it's important to know because when by the time Laura starts talking, she's going to be talking about PAs, FIs, CDPAP, she's going to be talking and talking like that, and you'll understand what this is. But a self-directing consumer basically is an individual that's capable of making their own choices. They understand their medical condition. They know what their needs are. They're capable uh, and responsible to uh, you know, manage a personal assistant and making sure those needs uh, that they are uh, desiring are, are met and that they're complying with the program. So that's someone basically who self-manages their care. The consumer is just that. It means the person who uh, through social services was off, uh, determined eligible to receive the services. And the consumer directed personal assistant uh, moving forward known as a PA is an adult basically who provides a personal assistant to the consumer or uh, you know, with the instruction by that con self-directed consumer or the self-directed consumer can appoint a designated representative. So for example, if you're living in a uh, town and you need help and you qualify and uh, you want to get involved with the CDPAP program, you can decide, you know, my, my niece is a nurse. She lives three towns away. I want her to be my designated representative so she can handle all the contacts with the FI and, you know, hire my aid, you know, oversee the care. Uh, so they're able to do that and appoint a designated representative. There's also, <laughs> if, uh, you know, with the designated representative, um, it's a note that a consumer spouse, parent, or a designated representative can't also be the PA. That's one of the restrictions. They need to be separate individuals. And uh, it is, uh, there had been prior to 2016, a situation where the state did not allow this program to hire uh, PAs that lived in the home that were relatives. That has changed since 2016, so other family members that live in the home can be a PA. Hoping this is clear so far. The designated representative, again, uh, is a self-directed consumer that has delegated authority to instruct and supervise the, the personal uh, assistant to perform those responsibilities. We talked about that a little bit, but there's also uh, what's called the non-directing self-consumer and it's basically uh, for an individual that does not really understand and would not be able to manage their care independently and uh, need, a, need to have a designated representative uh, that would be the, take the place, it would be a legal guardian, a parent, or sometimes I know in Orange County that Adult Protective Services has petitioned the court and applied for guardianship for certain individuals that are remaining to live in the community that needed someone to oversee and manage their care. So that is a possibility as well. The stable uh, medical condition is also a definition, meaning that person needs to be stable uh, with a medical condition. It does not mean that uh, they, they can't have chronic health care uh, conditions because that is uh, required really. Um, what it means is that their uh, medical condition isn't expected to drastically decline or drastically improve or get better, meaning they have long-term home health care needs. Uh, that they you know, may need assistance with uh, daily living skills, uh, you know, task, uh, tasks. Uh, they need uh, an aid to provide you know, uh, hands-on care, bathing, dressing, grooming, uh, things like that, uh, assistance with ambulation. So there needs to be uh, a situation where this person is determined to have long-term care needs. And that's determined through assessment evaluation we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. And lastly, uh, fiscal intermediary otherwise known as FIs, uh, basically means that an a entity that has a contract with social services uh, to provide wage and benefit processing uh, for the consumer directed personal assistant. So a lot of times when people would talk about uh, CDPAP a while back, they would talk about FIs as being just a fiscal intermediary, just a Medicaid pass-through. Um, it is more than that. There's a, they're, they're held to a higher standard 
Uh, so it is important when you're choosing an FI that you take a look at the company and the history and the background and see what other, you know, how long they've been in, in service and in business and how well they do. In terms of uh, scope of services and eligibility, we're going to talk about. Um, again, we've already talked about uh, this defined as uh, a provision of some or total assistance with personal home care tasks by either an aide or some skilled nursing and uh, under the direction and supervision of the consumer or the designated representative. And again, that uh, assistance is determined through assessment and evaluation uh, that is coming up in the next slide. Uh, do note though that if there's an individual that needs assistance with just nutritional and environmental supports, uh, I think it's still the case that that person would only be authorized no more than eight hours a week of service. <clears throat> what this service is not um, a service for is people that are looking for homemaking or errand services and things like that. Uh, you really need to have a medical necessity to be involved with this uh, service. I know that the county uh, uh, office for the aging, uh, generally office, uh, offer those services through what's called an ISEP program. So if you need more information about that, you can uh, just ask us or we can refer you. In terms of eligibility, um, you need to be eligible for medical assistance. I mean, basically eligible for Medicaid. That's the key thing. Uh, we'll uh, cover uh, some basics about that um, in a little bit. But you need to be eligible for Medicaid. You need to be eligible for long-term care services as this other uh, piece, this other uh, bullet says, but that is determined by uh, what's called getting uh, assessed, a uniform assessment survey, UAS. Uh, I, at the end of this uh, PowerPoint, we do have uh, uh, contact information and links uh, so you can get that information directly and how to schedule, but you need to uh, be determined eligible for the, uh, the service after the assessment process. We'll, uh, explain in more detail. I'm sure Laura will have a lot of information to talk about that. Having a stable medical condition we talked about, being self-directing uh, or uh, non self-directing and having a representative we already mentioned. Uh, needing some or total assistance with more, one or more tasks uh, is a requirement. When they do the assessment, they actually come up with a scoring mechanism that will determine whether someone is eligible. What I will say is when, that, when those assessments are scheduled, is that it is extremely important for uh, someone who really knows that person well to be present and be part of that assessment. I always think of my father when I think about his, he had a, a few uh, you know, real chronic uh, health conditions. And uh, if I weren't out at his house and he had somebody come and say, how you doing Joe? He said, oh, cool, fine, clean bill of health. And it's not, it was not the case, it was high risk. So uh, it's important to be honest uh, in those, uh, when those assessments take place. And obviously being willing to fulfill the consumer's responsibilities uh, be, uh, in participating with the program. We'll talk about what those responsibilities are uh, in the next couple of slides. And, uh, and the other requirement is really uh, participating as needed, uh, either the consumer or the designated representative in uh, the reassessment. Every six months, uh, the plan or the, uh, the managed long-term care plan or MCL will uh, require a reassessment those reassessments is basically doing the UAS all over again, seeing if there's been a change of condition. And, uh, you know, that that happens every six months. There's also, uh, you know, every six months or as, con as conditions change is also an option. Okay. So the assessment and authorization process, well, actually, be before we get into the assessment authorization process, let me talk about the some of the roles, more of the roles of the consumer with this program. So basically, when someone enters into this uh, program and, and, and is authorized hours, they are responsible not only for, um, well, they have to be responsible for recruiting, hiring, um, directing, training uh, their aid themselves. So the way it was set up was that people were supposed to hire people they knew and trusted, uh, family member, friends, neighbors, and they take on the responsibility for identifying them, uh, training and educating them to what their needs are, and, uh, and then helping set them up with the FI that they choose by sending that person to that company for application, bringing their medical, their uh, I-9 information, their, um, you know, their MMRs, PPDs, there's a few requirements and that's pretty much about it. But they're responsible for managing that 
They're also responsible for terminating if, uh, and replacing. We always encourage that when people choose their PA uh, and someone who they know and trust is great, but you also should have a backup uh, and have maybe another PA on standby or split your time up a little bit so that if something happens to one of the personal assistants, um, you have a backup plan so that uh, someone, you, you, there's no service disruption. You need, the people need to, consumer needs to maintain a proper home environment that's safe uh, and also to comply with labor laws um, as specified between the member and the fiscal intermediary. The member and the FI enter into a memor memorandum of understanding. So all this stuff is spelled out uh, in, the, in the memorandum of understanding. They uh, are also responsible for uh, reviewing the uh, and you know, verifying the, the validity of the time slips. We use an electronic visit verification, so that makes it pretty clear. So people uh, you know, sign in and sign out electronically, so there's, it limits the ability or, or the, the, it, it limits uh, any discrepancy with time when people sign in and sign out electronically. So there's uh, you know, lessens the room for fraud because that was uh, one of the concerns of this program with people putting in for time that they did not serve. But it is the consumer's responsibility to verify that and accurately uh, get it submitted. And lastly, um, they uh, notify the FI of any changes. If, like, if they won the lottery and their financial condition changed, then uh, you know, they're not going to be eligible for this program, uh, possibly. So anyway, that's some of the consumer's responsibilities. The assessment and authorization. So what happens is that the uh, consumer first needs to uh, meet Laura, no, meet someone like Laura, or find out about this first. A lot of people uh, don't understand it or don't know how to, who to contact. Local area, you know, Office for Aging, Department of Social Services, <coughs> other uh, companies that provide this service are a good uh, starting point. But once you determine you want to go this route, you have to get a physician's order and then schedule a nursing assessment. And again, that is a UAS assessment. Uh, the initial, they also call it conflict-free assessments where uh, a person would call Maximus, have a nurse uh, point, you know, Employed by the state to actually do the initial assessment. After that initial assessment is done, the managed care organization or the managed long-term care plan would do a, a identical assessment. And uh, what the state does is just verify eligibility based on the patient review and the home assessment. Uh, the, the managed care organization does the same type of assessment, concurs with the, uh, the fact that there's a need or they're eligible, but they also from there develop a care plan. And that care plan then is submitted back to the state for approval, and then the and the authorized hours are determined. I'm hoping I'm not losing anybody. Keep you writing your questions down. That's a lot of information, but it, the timing of this is really important because uh, generally a lot of times these services uh, don't start until the first of a calendar month. So um, you uh, it's important to get those assessments done pretty timely. We talked about the notice of decision, basically, uh, that's uh, given by the state that allows us to start the care. During this whole time that this process is happening, if you're working with someone like Laura or, or in the community, it's, you should be at the same time on a parallel uh, scope, you'd be working and getting your PA activated. Uh, because once that approval takes place, you don't want to lag time to get the uh, services started. This is important, actually, uh, too. So. The authorization, again, there's reassessments every six months once there's, those hours are identified. If there's a disagreement with the, the, the outcome or the hours, that, and this happens, does happen at times, if the consumer or the designated representative feel that the hours are not sufficient, uh, they, there's, with the managed care organizations, there is an appeal process internally where they could request a, re, a, a medical review, a utilization review, and uh, the plans are obligated to do so. If they can't come to an agreement and they're still feeling that the hours are not adequate, they could push it up to a point where they request a fair hearing. Uh, and the fair hearings, I believe, are, are managed. The state contracts out with legal services of the Hudson Valley to uh, represent uh, consumers that are uh, requesting fair hearings. And um, I don't know if I have their information uh, listed here, but I could get that for people if they're, uh, if they're wanting to get uh, that contact information. But um, yeah, Legal Services of the Hudson Valley does that through a program called ICANN. And I don't know what ICANN stands for right now, but uh, if uh, I can get that information too.
The fiscal, mediary, uh, fiscal intermediary, I want to tell you about the responsibilities of the FI, and I'm going to use my own cheat sheet here. But uh, basically, the FI uh, processes the wages, benefits, uh, they deter, you know, take care of the income tax, uh, other withholdings, workers' comp, unemployment insurance. The FI is responsible for doing all of that. They also ensure the health status uh, and the other uh, records are complete with the, uh, the PA and they uh, maintain files for that. They monitor, uh, monitor the records for this uh, PA, uh, which again, include health assessments and other regulations that may apply that uh, the state may require. They also maintain a record for the consumer, maintaining the authorizations, uh, verifying and tracking the hours of service to make sure that they fall within the authorized hours. They, um, they notify the managed care organization if the FI feels that the consumer or the uh, designated representative is not fulfilling their role or are, are unable to, and it puts the patient's care at risk, uh, they would notify the managed care organization about that. And likewise, also notify the managed care organization if they go or are hospitalized or in a rehab or uh, if their condition has changed and ask for another uh, assessment to be done upon uh, discharge. The uh, other things that they do is a lot of you know, quality improvement stuff, reporting to the state, uh, about you know some outcomes and you know managing this authorization and referral process that they're held accountable for, and the list goes on and on. But there is a, you know a significant amount of responsibility for the FIs. So as far as um, you know the facts and myths, and this is a, a little deceiving. This title: Why choose the UDPAP service as facts or myth? And it's a combination of all. I will tell you that the you know you. One of them is get care from people you love, uh, who love you most and you can trust. That is true. And that's a lot of times what people do and they wanna do. Uh, but it is though, uh, you know, you, you end up uh, sometimes, there's our families that don't want family members or someone they know providing the care. So it's not always the case, but it is you know, a personal preference for most people. Obviously they get involved with this program. Uh, they wanna main, uh, just select people who they know and trust. Uh, the other uh, myth, not, uh, you need help at home, but don't do well with strangers. Again, that's a personal preference. Uh, most of the time people, when first talk about home care through the traditional model, through a licensed home care agency, they have concerns. They don't know who this person is coming in. Sometimes it takes three or four days before they find someone they really connect with. But <clears throat> when they do connect, it works, it works, you know, it works really well as, at the same time. But usually, people will uh, prefer when they look at this program to want to work, have someone they know and trust. The, the fact that uh, it's like you can't find compassionate, reliable care from an agency, um, that's a myth because you can. And uh, I've seen it, you know, and over the years where, you know, the aides that we've sent in to care for people, uh, you know, their care managers, geriatric care managers, family members rave about uh, the patients. And, and there's a lot of times that they love the rate more than they love anybody else. So. Uh, it depends again on, on the match and how that person is managed. You prefer to direct and receive care without agency restrictions. That is definitely a fact. Uh, there are certain limitations uh, when you receive services through a licensed home care agency uh, based on the scope of services that AIDS are allowed to provide or not uh, provide. For example, AIDS can't provide, can't do eye drops, they can't administer medication. They can't, you know, really do any, you know, wound care, dressing changes, or catheter care. Um, there's, uh, they can't drive. Uh, usually, uh, the patients with consumer directed care, you're responsible for providing the training. Uh, so, there's, uh, you can train an aide to do uh, much more than a, a traditional trained aide can provide that service. And maybe Laura, when you talk, you could talk about how, uh, maybe, maybe how you work with people to help them get the training to the aid that they need. Right now with the internet, there's so many resources on, you know, safe, you know, how to safely, uh, you know, transfer patients, you know, back safety and other, you know, things that the, you know, the consumer or the designated representative would benefit from in, in, in teaching and training their aid. So I'm sure that uh, we help with that. The flexibility on how to use hours, that is a fact. You're basically authorized a number of hours weekly, however the consumer and the uh, aid feel uh, they want to utilize those hours when they need it uh, day to day is appropriate. So as long as they don't exceed the authorized hours, and if there's a reason why, and if it can change a condition why they feel they need to exceed the hours for a particular week, 
they need to contact the FI and their managed care organization and get approval for additional hours. And lastly, uh, fact, hiring, training, supervise your aid. And that is uh, certainly a fact. You're totally responsible for doing that. And um, that is, uh, you know, we, 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 I'm sure we help people get that training information they need. So at this point, I am going to turn it over to Laura and have Laura take this information and put it, make it all uh, real by explaining, uh, you know, her role and how she, Laura is probably one of the most passionate people you'll ever meet about this service. Um, so uh, she, she's out there every day kind of coordinating and getting people uh, connected to uh, set this CDPAP service up. So Laura. Hi everyone. I can't see the, I still see it. Hi everyone, my name is Laura. As Dana said, I am a huge advocate for CDPAP. Um, it's for seniors and those that are disabled and are desperately you know, in need of services. There's pros and cons to both. In, in all honesty, and it's there's no right or wrong. It's basically what the consumer needs and no two consumers are alike. So what one consumer needs, the other one may not. Um, the most important thing for me anyway, it's it covers hard to serve areas, which lately has been all of Hudson Valley. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, especially with the pandemic. Um, so that's good. A lot of people that A, um, are taking care of their loved ones regardless. Some people feel a little weird about actually charging to get paid for a loved one, you know, while they take care of them, but the, it's, you're not. I mean, the bottom line is, you, I mean, everyone needs to work. Then there's the enrollment process. The enrollment process, it's a little tricky. I mean, you already have to, to me, it's all about control and you're controlling your, your life. So it's kind of difficult where, you know, people are telling you, you need this, you need that. So CDPAP makes you still independent and you're in charge of the person that you hire, which is a good thing. Um, there's challenging challenges in that as well. I, like I said, I'm very like crystal and transparent. And what's most important is what is best for the consumer. Um, it's really difficult to fire your granddaughter, your daughter, your family member when you feel that they're not up to par. So that is a challenge. But the good thing about it is if you get a great, um, I know that he, um, Dana kept on referring to it as an FI, but basically it's the agency that you choose. Um, to, you know, to do the services for you to pay your um, PA. If you get someone, they are your advocate as well, because if the hours aren't matching up that you, to your liking, you can call the agency and say, listen, the hours aren't matched up, and you don't have to have that awkward conversation with your loved one, in which case the coordination department would call and say, um, I think uh, your hours didn't match or something. And there is accountability. So I know it's good because you want to be independent, but really no one wants to fire, or, you know, or let go of someone in the family. That's kind of awkward. Then that's where the oversight comes in. So agencies do um, cover oversight, um, check-ins. And like Dana had mentioned, we eliminate, well, not we, but most agencies have eliminated um, the timesheets because there's a lot of flexibility with those timesheets. So now there is, they have um, on the phone, there's an app and you log in and log out. That does not mean that you have to sit at home all day. You log in, you can take them to restaurants out into the city. It's not just for medical needs. The bottom line is a lot of people are lonely and, and part of making you uh, feel better health-wise has to do a lot with um, a companionship. So while they're providing the service of light housekeeping, cooking, perhaps get prompting you to remind you for your medicine, at least, um, you also have that companion with you. So what better than someone that you care about, you know, and it, it's just easier. Especially during, like, for example, the pandemic, no one really wanted, it was huge last year, and no one really wanted strangers coming in, you know, even though they were, you know, home attendants or PCAs or HHAs, they really didn't want strangers coming in, you know, revolving door in their house. They were scared. Um, and so were the aides. The aides didn't want to go, you know, to the home. Maybe there's eight family members, maybe there's one, but they're still being exposed. So CDPAP really took a huge, you know, it, it booms last year, um, where everyone was just with their, you know, loved ones. It eliminates the revolving door. Also, for example, everyone always talks about, you know, seniors, of course, because it's, you know, seniors, but I'll give you an example how this program is awesome. So there is a couple that I have. They're 80 years old and they have a they're in their 80s. They have um, an adult child who has a lifelong disability and they're, they're seniors themselves. So this program works great 
because the parents are getting elderly, but they can have either a sibling that already knows the history. So it's not just for seniors. It's like it's it is for seniors, but I'm saying it's all different situations um, where you can have someone that you've been taking care of lifelong and introduce someone else and you train them because you know their needs, you know their wants, and you train them um, to best assist the person. I'm trying to think what else. Um, other than the trust, um, which is huge when you're getting better. Now the logistics of it is, let's say you want the service. You call an agency, there's so many facets to it that it is overwhelming. You need to pick um, a managed, uh, qualified for Medicaid without a doubt. There's that first. Then secondly, you have to choose a managed long-term care, which is the one that will you know, take care of everything and pay for the services that you're gonna be getting. Third is the agency, licensed home health care agency that you choose that will facilitate the process. Once you get all that, the object is, and it's per state, if you get everything in by the 20th of the month, that's the state, then the following month on the first, you start services, which is fantastic. But like I had said at the beginning, no two situations are alike. So maybe you have an emergency and you can't wait those three weeks because you missed the cutoff. There's something for that too. You call the Department of Social Services and they will work with you um, in calling something called bridging the gap. So they'll substitute those three weeks until things get into place. All this is important, but like I said, no two people are alike, no two situations are alike. So that's the beauty of this program. It's geared toward, it's not black or white. There's a lot of gray, which is fantastic because everyone needs assistance differently. Um, I guess uh, I'm trying to think what else that I can say. There's many situations after they choose the MLTC, um, then there's um, the doctors have to fill out the forms like Dana had mentioned. That's not as complicated as it is, although doctors are inundated. Um, you have, which is great, you have both the MLTC and the agency assisting you in getting those forms. So it's not like you're going to be handed a packet and say, good luck. Once you have everything together, you can give us a call. It depends on you know who you choose for the MLTC, which is the managed long-term care. It depends on the agency that you choose, which is the licensed home health care agency. Um, together, they're supposed to work as a unit. And the bottom line is to get you the services that you're in most need for. I'm trying to think what else. Um, there is assessments like Dana had mentioned. Um, some people are disappointed. Let's say they get, they're hoping for, let's say eight hours a day, seven days a week. And the eight, you know, they come back with five hours. That's disappointing. And you want more there is you can do an appeal. And no one that I know likes to admit and say, I can't walk. I'm having trouble remembering things. I've been slipping and falling. I left the stove on. No one likes to really, like who, who thrives on that? But unfortunately, that is what you have to, you know, say all your deficits when they do the assessment. So that's like emotionally challenging as well. But that is what you have to do. Don't describe yourself on your best day, even though we all know we want more of those best days. Describe yourself on your worst day so that they see that where is the need and they apply those hours accordingly when it comes to getting you approved for services. So there's a lot of, um, emo I, I say emotional because, you know, no one likes to admit that, you know, there's a need, that they have a need, that they can no longer do what they used to do. So this is not to take over or take away their independence. This program I am hugely an advocate about because it helps you be as independent as possible with the assistance that you agree with that you feel that you're comfortable with. And that would be with someone that you care about, that you love and that you trust. Maybe not love, because you don't love all your neighbors, but that you're comfortable with. Um, trying to think, did I miss anything, Dana? Did I cover? No, uh, I, I, think, I think you covered um, pretty much uh, everything. Um, I think that when people start the process, they just need to stick with it. And you know, one of the most, most, most difficulties we have sometimes with processing and getting people set up is getting the PA to complete the application and get the medical to us. So mm -hmm. if you're, you have, if we always ask for the help. I mean, we, we, we try to do whatever we get. Laura, Laura, and I'm sure other people do, will ride all over the country to try to get you know, people's paperwork together so that we can get this person, the services uh, started. Cause you can't do anything until we activate the PA. That, believe it or not, is sometimes the most difficult piece. Um, the other thing, you know, we didn't talk about it too much, but I think just I want to do mention the Medicaid eligibility component 
-hmm. And uh, in 2021, uh, to be eligible for community Medicaid, uh, the individual rate is, uh, was increased uh, to 884 a month as far as uh, uh, income coming in and uh, savings of no more than 15,900. The couple's uh, rate was 1,300 monthly income with a 23,400 uh, savings limit. So let me give you an example. I mean, sometimes people uh, get confused about community Medicaid and institutional Medicaid. Community Medicaid, you can own your own home, you can own your car, um, you can have investments. What counts as income is the income that you're drawing from on those invest investments, your social security, retirement. Um, if, you, if the cutoff is 884 and you're bringing home 1,884, you still go through the process. Um, you can you know, apply for Medicaid. They're gonna tell you that you're over. There's an overage. And then you have an option of doing a Medicaid spend down or getting help by, usually through your plan will help that, is to help choose a pooled income trust company uh, and set up a pooled income trust where that overage can be placed in a separate account and you can access to pay your rent or your mortgage. Um, it is uh, an, an avenue that a lot of people have been using to get services. And I encourage people to look into that because I've met so many different times people that were living in a, a, a retirement community or senior housing and telling me they can't live there anymore. They need more help than they can get and they, they, they can't live there and they're not eligible for Medicaid. And sometimes they're only $50 over or you know a couple of hundred dollars over. I mean, it's really that close. So there's a lot of handholding and education that needs to happen. Of course, when we run into people that have a real more complicated assets, you know, we refer them to an elder law attorney or financial planner uh, or somebody that has uh, you know, more expertise in that area. We don't provide legal advice, but that is, uh, is, is, is an obstacle, but it's not uh, something that can't be overcome. So uh, I just wanted to mention that. And there's a look thank, back. Thank you, Dana. So in terms of providing more advice, we have a bunch of questions for you. I so see. hopefully you can advise our participants on these questions. Okay. So the first question that um, came in is that, is there a specific department at the Department of Social Services that you should call in case of an emergency in the CDPAP program? DSS? Um, I don't, if there's an emergency and you're already receiving services through Medicaid, um, it would be your managed care, it would be your Medicaid uh, long-term care provider, unless you have straight you have Medicaid through DSS, I guess you would call the long-term care unit, um, or uh, if it was a crisis that involved, you know, may, may involve adult protective services, I mean, that's another uh, avenue, I would say. But uh, yes. generally, if they're involved with a plan, the FI and the managed long-term care plan would be the first go-to people for that, because... DSS is generally authorizing the services. They're not managing the care at this, at this point. Exactly. And if you're in the consumer directed program and you have an emergency where consumer directed is no longer working for you, you your aid um, leaves and you can't find a replacement aid, then through DSS, you can fill out a 1050 form for immediate need Medicaid that can go to the unit and then they can um, work towards getting managed care in place, but there is no number um, for a CDPAP emergency per se with DSS. The next question is how long does the process normally take to get CDPAP in place? It, it usually depends on if everything's submitted. So if like our stars are aligned and everything is um, submitted accordingly, you can have services the following month, provided that everything's submitted before the 20th. So like right now, if everyone, if I get a new, let's say there's a new person that needs services, if everything's submitted before the 20th, both assessments are done, by May 1st, they'll have services. So it's really on how quickly um, forms are done, doctors, you know, fill out the forms for the consumer. And also you have to get the Medicaid in place first. So that, once yes. the application goes into Westchester County, Right now, we've been seeing roughly, you know, three weeks in terms of turnaround, but that's very quick. So it really is quite variable. And then it also depends on how long it takes the family to pull together the four categories of paperwork that make up the packet that goes into DSS. So generally between starting the process, gathering the paperwork, submitting the application and getting care in place does take more than a month. Yeah, it depends on how far along they are with the process with Medicaid. Sometimes people come to us that are already in the process of applying for Medicaid 
And what you mentioned, Sarah, was important when people apply um, or if they're having someone help them apply is that there's an immediate need uh, set uh, identification that is, is uh, basically helps direct that those Medicaid applications, I think, do get taken care of within a three week time frame. If this, if you it's, it's expedited processing once you have your packet into Medicaid, but mm -hmm. you still have to submit the documents that are required yeah. Yeah. and be financially eligible. Correct. So our next question is, and this is a, this is a big question. So I know I'm an active POA and an active healthcare proxy, so I can't be a CDPAP aid. But if I'm not currently the CDPAP aid and the consumer is still competent, is it okay for the healthcare proxy power of attorney on paper to be the consumer directed aid? So I guess this person is asking, they've been appointed to be power of attorney healthcare proxy, but the consumer still can make all their own decisions so they don't need to act. Is it okay for that person to be the aid? I would defer to an attorney, Sarah, for that question. I'm like kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if, if you have a, a POA in place, you're eligible to that you know that you're eligible to step in at any point in time to provide that uh, that service as being a power of attorney. Um, so I, I would say um, I would say probably not, but I would I would seek uh, legal advice on that question. Uh, if a power of attorney is actually executed in place and ready to go. Um, I would, I would say probably not. Okay. So next question is what happens if your CDPAP aide wants to take a two week vacation? If they work for a company that pays vacation time, that's great. Cause they get paid for that service when they're gone. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, time off is totally acceptable. Um, again, the, the, the need to have, a, you know, maybe another PA or two also process. So you have a backup. Is important because um, if you can't do it without two weeks of care, um, that's going to pose a real problem for the uh, the consumer. So, so you have a backup in place. This is my take on it. Um, at least whenever anyone gets over, let's say anything over 20 hours, I usually suggest that they have someone else. Sometimes two or three people. You can have as many people as you'd like. They don't have to work immediately for you. It's like money in the bank. You only take it out when you use it. Same thing with the person. You only utilize them when needed, but at least they're already cleared. They did the physical, they did the application, and they're just there standby in case that PA calls in sick, can't make it, or prime example last year during COVID, they had to quarantine for 14 days. So um, I always suggest having more than one. Thank you. It the next question is, is there a list of home care agencies that participate in the CDPAP program? On the, uh, at the back, last slide, I'll explain. There's uh, links and telephone numbers. There is a link for all licensed home care agencies in the state. There's also a link for uh, the, the recent um, Department of Health uh, uh, administrator's letter that basically shows all the current FIs um, that are approved uh, by contract. There's 68 of them. So we do have uh, we do have that at the end of this uh, section listed. Thank you. So our next question is: How do I find a CDPAP aid if a family member is not going to be the aid? So I suggest to people, um, neighbors, perhaps a religious, you know, group. Let's say if a church or volunteers. There's always people. Mm -hmm. I've also seen people put in their local. Let's say. Uh, library, they put an ad in, and then they, they can interview the person that they're comfortable with. But basically that's, or a local, another thing that I've uh, seen, um, people that are studying in nursing school, LPNs, they enjoy that as well. And that's something that, you know, they have, like you go to the local school and ask if they have students. <clears throat> they have to be over 18. So it, it, probably not a high school student, but a college student would totally work as well. Yeah, it's a what are some of those other requirements uh, to be a CDPAP aide? So you need to um, be 18, you know, 18 or over. Um, you cannot be the spouse or the partner, um, just saying what you can't be. It could be a family member. Um, a parent can be the child, as long as the child's over 21. Basically 18 and up and pass a drug screen uh, for the agency. For us. We, we well, for us, that's true. Because it's not, some agencies don't have, it depends on the requirement. Every agency is different. But basically 18 and up and pass, you know, a screening. Of, of let's say application process. That's it. So Sarah, they have to be a elaborate. citizen. I'm sorry, yeah. if I could elaborate on that a little bit too. And I, I'll tell you, you know, a lot of times um, 
when people don't have an available PA, but they've really liked this program and want to go for it, it's tricky. You know, I, I generally tell people, if you need to put it out on, on Craigslist to look for somebody, you probably should go with a licensed home care agency. At least you know that they're drug screened, their criminal background check. I mean, it's risky, you know? So, you, uh, you know, what you need to do is, uh, you know, you need to be careful and make sure you're making good selection. Um, although, you know, I've known people that have done it. Uh, I, you know, it depends if your designated representative is really on top of things and really does their own check and does you know, this, you know, supervise the aid and very medically in tune to what the needs are. I mean, it can be done. Um, I mean, people I know have gone to care.com looking. I mean, there's people have been going in different places. Um, but um, it, you know, what, what Laura and what we try to do in the, the basically the way this program works is to try, try to find someone in your community that you know or trust or somebody, a friend of yours that knows somebody that really trusts them that's known. Um, so um, you're not getting a complete stranger coming into your home. Great. So another question is, can I get durable medical equipment through the CDPAP program, what if I need a hospital bed or a special chair? Yeah, that's uh, the, the managed care organization is uh, providing the, the overall uh, coordination uh, is responsible for providing durable medical equipment. So all the, you know, uh, whether it be depends and chalks and, you know, medical equipment um, that is provided through this program. Right. And that also includes uh, PPE like gloves and surgical masks mm -hmm. in, in today's environment. Exactly. So who would be a candidate for CDPAP? Is it just seniors or is it good for other people too? It's good for other people as well. Um, it, like I said, it could be, let's say, someone that needs uh, within arm's length um, supervision, um, someone that uh, does like, let's say, uh, elopement. Like if someone, let's say, someone that has a diagnosis, let's say, of um, autism, right? And they're young and they need uh, someone, you know, to always be with them. The mother's overwhelmed. So you can have a family member assist. That's one, um, that's one possibility. Um, it's just basically that there's a medical need um, and that you need services and someone to assist you with your, you know, daily living skills. Okay, another, another question. I know home care aides from agencies can't drive a car with me in it. Can my CDPAP aide drive the car and take me to doctor's appointments? Absolutely. They can take you to doctor's appointments, restaurants, museums, anything that has to do with taking you anywhere. That's fine. Yeah. Companies probably operate, different FIs may operate differently. I know that, you know, uh, and we talked about this uh, a little while ago. You know, I think in our company, you know, it would be the uh, patient's or family member's vehicle that's fully insured and well-maintained that they would be driven uh, by the aide. Um, you know, I don't, I don't believe that we would allow the aid to it. I maybe correct me, Laura, if I'm wrong. Do we allow the aid to use their own car to transport patients? No, a PA can, I mean, excuse me, a PCA or an HHA cannot have the consumer in their car, but a, a CDPAP program. Yes, they can. Okay. Thank you. Is, and we have another question. So is dementia and or Alzheimer's included in medical conditions to qualify for CDPAP services? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. A qualifier that probably scores them a five or over on the UAS assessment. So when the UAS assessment, they look at a number of uh, health uh, in, in uh, patient needs, um, including like mental health. Uh, they have, there's a scoring for mental health conditions as well. Um, so, uh, but the dementia, Alzheimer's is uh, definitely the situation. Okay, here's another question. Is a CDPAP aid allowed to make pillboxes? If the, if, the, if the consumer wants them to do it, they could construct the pillboxes, <laughs> really. I mean, really, they could fill them, they can make the pillboxes. I mean, it's, it depends on what the, what the you know, consumer wants um, their PA to be responsible for. So they're responsible for training. So and that, that's very different from a licensed agency, correct? Yeah, licensed agency, we're not allowed to set the meds. It would have to be a nurse that comes in and does that. And, and how do you train your, your aid? Is there a guide out there? Is there a guide? Right, like are there materials on how to train your CDPAP aid? You know, I'm, I'm sure that there are. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's everything's, uh, you know, with the internet right now, there's all types of educational materials you can get uh, pretty easily. And I said, I would encourage that for sure, because if you have somebody that, you know, needs to use a higher lift, or someone that's really at risk of falls and needs, you know, arm's length supervision and assistance with, 
you know, ambulation or, you know, knows how to like, you know, uh, you know, fall prevention, you know, I mean, a lot of these things are really important, but they, they, you know, we could assist them and direct them to ways in where they can find the training on their own. That is the, uh, the, the point of it is that the uh, consumer, the designated representative needs to be responsible to provide that training. Terrific. So we have a couple more minutes. So if anyone else has a question, please put it into the Q&A or the chat so we can address it. If that question happens to pop up after the program, we'll have the slides and the video of our program posted by Friday on our website, which is seniorlawday.info. And we also on our website will have an ask us button so you can ask your question to us and then we'll get that question to Dana or to Laura, so they'll be able to answer that question after the program. Yeah, and you could call uh, call us, you know, for any reason, whether we can help you or not. If you're in a service area of ours or not, if you're listening, you have a relative that lives out of state, they have a similar situation. Um, you know, please use this as a resource. You know, we we like to think that there's no dead ends uh, when it comes to getting home care, um, and uh, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's challenging. Uh, but uh, we, we'd like to be a, a help whether we provide the service or not. Terrific, Dana. We have a great question that just came in. So does Medicare or Medicaid pay for your agency's services? Do you do CHHA services or just Medicaid home care? No, we, our company provides, uh, we're, we have a licensed home care service agency known as Elixa that provides PCA and HHA services privately and through contracts. What uh, this individual is talking about is a, a CHA certified home health agency that basically bills uh, Medicare. It's a, and it, you can only access that service through Medicare if there's a skilled nursing need or therapy need. So Medicare would pay for the uh, short-term uh, rehab and nursing. Uh, usually it happens when someone's discharged from a nursing facility or, um, you know, coming coming home from a hospital, they would receive help on a short term basis and then discharge. But it's important what I, I always say with those certified home care agencies and you know the people that are planning those discharges. Sometimes you can just tell that there's going to be more needs after four weeks that this person is going to need ongoing service. You know, the earlier you can start that process or get the discharge planner thinking that, geez, maybe we should start you know applying for community Medicaid or looking at you know long term care, the better. Because you know, a lot of times hospitals and skilled nursing facilities are just looking to get that person out, get them the short-term services. Short-term services are looking to provide those short-term services and discharge. Um, and so it's really, you gotta advocate for yourself and, you know, and push the process. Um, but no, we don't provide CHA services now. We do own a CHA uh, in uh, New York City, uh, Westchester that's in development and we have one CHA in Florida, but nothing local. And sometimes working with a geriatric care manager, which is another kind of professional that we haven't spoken to about really today, is helpful because that geriatric care manager can help be that advocate, help get the patient discharge, help set up, work with that discharge planner to get CHA services, work with the family to be able to talk to Dana and or Laura to get home care services, and sometimes help you find a CDPAP aid. And it's, it's like having a a personal concierge to help you work through the care end. So sometimes that's very helpful if you are uncomfortable doing it on your own. It's extremely so, helpful for us when the people utilize a geriatric care manager uh, or an elder law attorney to help get things set up uh, because they come to us pretty much well-educated and ready to go. So those are uh, you know, great referrals when so, we get this. So Dana and Laura, I don't know if there's other slides that you want to, you know, go through quickly, um, or you know, I just want to respect uh, folks' time. We said this would, you know, end by eleven. So um, just uh, the last slide that I had up, um, you know, we had a couple, you know, testimonials here from, uh, you know, uh, people participate in a consumer directed program for people to, you know, it's just a statement basically telling how pleased they are utilizing a CDPAP service is uh, important. We're trying to get a live person to come in that's really a recipient of these services to participate, but we have, we're not able to do that just now, but, but maybe another time. And the last screen um, you know, is uh, information. Uh, somebody had asked about contact information with the, where the FIs could be uh, located. And on that last screen, there's a directory uh, and then links that basically the uh, 
the New York State Department of Health RFO, that link will bring you to the 68 FIs that are currently approved in New York State to provide the services. Uh, the top one is, uh, you know, listing of managed long-term care plans, so you know which managed long-term care plans cover service areas. And the New York State conflict-free assessor is uh, New York Medicaid Choice. That's where you make that initial phone call for the UAS assessment. Um, and uh, our information about our company is on the page. And again, you know, feel free to contact us for any uh, future questions you have. And uh, thank you for allowing us uh, the time today. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, uh, Dana and Laura and Sarah. Uh, I do want to just quickly show a couple of things on the website. This is seniorlawday.info, which is a great resource um, for all of our programs to supplement what you know Dana and, and Laura have been talking about. This is our, our next webinar. We do have free one-on-one uh, -on -one consultations coming up on May 12, and this is where you can sign up, as well as this is where this tab is where the webinar and presentation will go up on um, by, by Friday. And then there's just a lot of really great you know, resources on, on Medicaid and other topics. I did wanna just uh, acknowledge our sponsors. Um, so there we go, um, you know, different people that have sponsored us. And there's three different levels that we offer, attorneys, uh, financial planners, geriatric care managers, as well as other supporters. Um, Chester Library System that puts this, uh, you know, maintains this website for us. If you have a, a question for us on the website, Bruce was just right. showing yeah, on right. the right hand pane about halfway down, we have our Ask Us button. So if you right. click on Ask Us, it will pop up, ask your question. And if it specifically pertains to CDPAP and today's program, we will put you in touch with Dana and or Laura and they will uh, send you an email back and answer your question. Okay, well, thank you to everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'm going to end the webinar now and, and have a great day. All right, thanks. You too now. Thank you. Bye-bye now.